I have cooked in these pieces of Falk copper cookware over 200 times. In this video, we're going to do a big in-depth review and cooking feature. I'm gonna let you know everything you need to know about Falk copper cookware, cook some hopefully delicious food, and I'm gonna let you know if I think these are good quality pieces of cookware for your money or not. Who knows? Let's jump in and get started. Hi guys, and welcome back to Uncle Scott's Kitchen. We are talking Falk copper cookware today. Uh, let's start out with kind of the 10,000 foot view and then we will drill down on the pans I have. I also have some other uh, copper cookware and stainless steel cookware we may compare and contrast a little bit as we go and talk a little bit about copper in general. Now Falk, as a company founded in 1958 in Belgium. So Belgish pans and apparently um, over in Belgium when they get tired of their fries and their waffles and the bedlam in Belgium calms down, they make quality cookware. Uh, they are pioneers in the field of bimetal. So these pans we're talking about today, they're copper on the outside and they have a layer of stainless steel bonded to the center. Fault claims that they use 850 tons of pressure to bond that stainless steel to the copper, which coincidentally is about the same amount of pressure I feel when my wife asks if she looks fat in a particular dress. Now these are 2.5 millimeter thick pans. I've got the small saucier, 1.4 quart. I've got a 3.2 quart medium sized saucier. And I have got a 12.6 inch, 32 centimeter kind of flagship um, frying pan. Now I got turned on to these Falks because I was looking for some heavier uh, copper cookware. I've got some uh, Moviels, I've got some Debouillets. Those manufacturers and others have moved to a little bit thinner copper these days, two millimeters or so thick. Um, I was looking for the more traditional, at least two and a half millimeter thick copper. And Falk, thankfully, is one of the few bigger manufacturers still making the thicker copper these days. Um, if you know much about copper cookware, you know that uh, for the most part, food never touches the copper. There are certain pans for jams or maybe egg whites where you, your food is actually in a, in a bare copper pan. In these though, for most normal cooking, they come lined. These are stainless steel lined with copper on the outside. Um, two and a half millimeters thick, 2.3 millimeters of that is the actual copper. So good, thick, heavy copper there. And then 0.2 millimeters is the stainless steel lining. Now, one thing you notice on these stainless steels, uh, the faults, it is a satinated, they call it, or matte type finish. It's a little grayer. So if you are used to other stainless steel cooking surfaces, like this is a Debouillet, very shiny, almost mirror-like. Same thing with a Moviel. These Falks are definitely grayer. And when I turn my head, I'm kind of used to seeing those mirror type finishes on the stainless steel cooking surfaces. When I see one of these out of the corner of my eye, it almost sometimes looks like they are out of focus. Now these stainless steel linings, I think are good choices for most home cooks. Um, I have got some other copper cookware. For example, this is a Duparquet and this is a Ruffoni. These are 10 lined and you got to be really on your game if you get some tin line copper. You got to really kind of be into it, if you will. I think the stainless steel is much safer. These can be preheated. Uh, the lining is a little bit tougher. The tin line copper, if you're not careful preheating it, you're not supposed to preheat it empty or without any fat or liquid in the pan, you can easily damage your tin lining. And not only can you damage it, for me, it kind of affects me psychologically. I always go a little bit in the back of my mind worry about those tin linings. I find that the stainless steel is a lot easier to cook in 
for a normal home cook. These real deal copper pans, they work really well on a gas cooktop. They work on flat tops. We'll do some testing on the electric flat top in the basement here in a bit. But they do not work on induction cooktops. If you have induction and are interested in Falk, I note that they make a copper core line with um, an induction compatible exterior. I think it's stainless steel, then they have a copper layer and then a stainless steel cooking surface, but I have not tried one of those yet. Okay, let's drill down on some stats and details on these guys for the big frying pan. This is a 32 centimeter frying pan in the incomprehensible metric system. Uh, it's also listed as a 12.6 inch frying pan. Still have not figured out what 0.6 of an inch is. Um, this thing is, let's see, wrote down 23 and a half inches tip to tail. So a very big pan, uh, about 13 inches rim to rim. And I think with some of these um, Belgian pans, they measure um, from the inside of the curve of the lip of the rim, but the pan does have a lip. And 13 inches rim to rim, including the lip, and about 10 and a half inches of actual cooking surface. So that is a lot of cooking surface. Just by way of comparison, an all-clad D3, uh, very popular pan, has about nine and a half inches. And that's listed as a 12-inch uh, pan. So you get about 21% more cooking surface with the Falk versus an all-clad D3. It's kind of interesting to note. Heavy pan as well, over seven pounds for that frying pan. And I do note that my wife uh, used it the other day and mentioned that it is a very heavy pan. She was trying to pick it up to uh, get some food out of the pan and noted, noted how heavy it actually is. Let's see, the medium sized saucier, 3.2 quart. Uh, this one is about five and a half pounds. And the little saucier here, this is a 1.4 quart. This one is still over three pounds, about three and a half pounds for this guy. Now this is the, the kind of gateway drug for me into the world of Falk Copper Cookware. I bought this on what they call a try me deal. It was $154 and I know what they're thinking here. They give you a screaming deal on a little pan like this. And if you like it, you buy more. So I bought it and I liked it and I bought more. So I've had this one almost two years now. And surprisingly to me, this became the most used pan in my kitchen. So I got a ton of cookware around here, do all kinds of reviews. This one gets used more than any other pan that I own. It's a great size. Uh, we got a little kid, um, six years old, and we tried to fix him hot breakfast. And this is a perfect size for oatmeal, cream of wheat, cheese grits. Um, heating a can of soup, making the occasional ramen noodles for one, two, three portions, a perfect size and it gets used all the time. Now this one is part of the uh, classic series and you notice that it has, I used to call them a French style, I should probably call these old world or classic style handle, um, cast iron and the new pans I bought are part of the signature line and they have stainless steel handles. Why did I make the change? The pan bodies are the exact same between the two lines, um, but I have run into some rusting issues with this cast iron handle. And um, if you're careful, I don't think it's a big deal. Sometimes I'm not as careful with the pan as I should be. In particular, when I make the cream of wheat, oatmeal, cheese grits, um, those typically need to be soaked. The pan needs to be soaked to clean it up and I leave this in the sink and it's there for a couple hours and I come back and I forget about it and it just has a little bit of rust on the handle. I do like the look of the cast handle uh, better than the stainless steel, but as far as maintenance and getting these handles wet and not having to worry about them, the stainless steel is definitely the way to go for safety and uh, maintenance reasons. And that little bit of rust is actually not that big of a deal. I'll occasionally clean it off and I've actually held the pan like this and stuck the, uh, the handle over a burner to kind of season a handle, kind of a crazy thing to do, but that works uh, fairly well. And as far as quality goes, these handles are well attached. Three rivets, I know some of you guys out there are anti-rivetous, but these are small rivets and they don't really get in the way very badly 
and the handles feel very securely attached. As a matter of fact, these Falks have an initial, uh, kind of right out of the uh, package, um, the first reaction, absolutely beautiful and a feeling of sturdiness and quality. Another thing you notice about the Falks on the uh, Sauciers, you notice that the outsides, very round, but on the insides, the sides are somewhat round up here, but there is definitely an angle at the sides of these pans. And it's not as pronounced on the smaller saucier, but even on the frying pan, you can see a bit of an angle. So a little bit more vertical uh, sides than perhaps you might see on something like Again, like on this all-clad D3, much more rounded sides on the interior. Let's talk a little bit about patina. Uh, copper cookware, you can kind of go one of two directions. You can polish it and keep it shiny, uh, which is what I do with some of my copper cookware. For example, this Rufoni, I keep this guy shiny and uh, polished up. My other copper, I just don't worry about it. And I kind of like the look of the patina it develops over time. Kind of gives it a rustic look. And this little guy here, I've probably cooked in this pan 150 times on a gas cooktop, and that's what it looks like. This one has been used heavily for four or five months, and you can see that the patina is developing. Uh, but one thing I will note is that the Falks, for whatever reason, uh, the patina seems to take um, a lot longer to develop on the Falks, and they kind of maintain a little bit more of a uh, brighter orangey copper color, lots longer than some of the other brands. Um, I got the lid for the Saucier, and because I guess this is never touching the gas flame and doesn't get quite as hot, it doesn't seem to patina in the same way that the, uh, the pans do. Now, as always, I paid for all this cookware with my own money. I have no relationship with Falk, and these opinions are all my own. I got this one for $154 on that Try Me uh, sale, and I believe that is still going on. I checked before doing the video. Uh, the Saucier, and I got it written down. I listed for $315, and I got it for $236. 25% off. The lid was about $90 on sale. And the big frying pan lists at $435. I got it on a 25% off Black's uh, Friday sale for about $315. Now, $315 for a frying pan, is that outrageous? Uh, maybe in one sense, but it is also a bargain. Um, a Debouille, similar size pan. I think that one is in the neighborhood of $700. A Matfer in the neighborhood of $600, and the Moviels are right in that range as well. Somehow, $315 for a frying pan, for a real deal copper frying pan in this category, actually seems like a screaming deal to me. Okay, for the cooking test, we are gonna focus on the larger saucier and the frying pan, because I have already done a full review of this guy. I've had this guy almost two years, and I reiterate and second that thumbs up that I gave it the first time. And I like this pan so much, how much did I like it? enough to buy one for my mom for Christmas. First, I want to test the pan's evenness. Copper, uh, real deal copper, really known for spreading heat evenly. Very important on a pan this big because it's so big. How big is it? It actually hangs over the burner grates and eyeballing underneath between the edge of the uh, burner ring and the edge of the pan, it's about three inches. So if this thing does not spread the heat, we will get a concentrated hot spot in the middle and pour cooking out towards the edges. Gonna start out here with some fried okra. Um, a, it's delicious, and B, you can really see the individual pieces of okra and how they are cooking. I have rolled my cut okra in some cornmeal, salt and pepper and get that in the pan. And what you notice here is nice, even cooking and sizzling edge to edge. So I think that real deal copper is spreading that heat nicely and evenly. Now 
Next up, let's get the uh, saucier involved and use the frying pan for a big uh, Sunday meal, kind of a sit on the couch after Sunday dinner type meal. Pork chops and gravy along with broccoli and cauliflower gratin. So let's look at the pork chops first. Uh, I got these uh, breaded up. Got the pan heated up. And note here that this big pan holds eight boneless um, supermarket pork chops without much crowding. And I think we got nice, even browning on those pork chops. And made up a little pork chop gravy. And for the cauliflower and broccoli gratin, I have found that I do love broccoli, a green veggie, especially when it's coated in bechamel and cheese sauce. I'm gonna get my ingredients ready first. Pay no attention to those Spanish peanuts. Uh, this was recorded back before Christmas and my wife was actually making peanut brittle for uh, gift baskets the uh, same day. But I've got a nice head of cauliflower and roughly enough broccoli to match that. Get it washed and cut up. I've got some Gruyere cheese, about a half a pound of it. And I should probably get out the cheese grater here, but sometimes I've found that it's easier to just go ahead and cut the cheese. Now I've got some buttered breadcrumbs, some butter, some flour, some milk, and the rest of my ingredients. What I want to do first is butter up a gratin dish, and then I'm also going to par cook the uh, broccoli and cauliflower just a little bit and take some of the crunchy edge off of those. And in the meantime, I'm gonna make the bechamel and cheese sauce in the saucier. Now these fog sauciers, one of the things you notice is that there is an angle between the cooking surface and the sidewall of the pan, and there is almost a corner, if you can call something round a corner, but there is a definite angle where the two meet. And what I was worried about with the saucier is that maybe food might kind of get stuck in that corner just a little bit. So we should be able to see this here with the bechamel. And I don't know if anyone else uses this nomenclature, but in my mind, I call this a 332 bechamel. It helps me remember uh, three tablespoons of flour, three tablespoons of butter, and two cups of uh, cold milk. So I get my butter melting, get my flour in there. And what I wanna check here is that kind of corner or that angle. And here I have two different whisks I am using, a smaller one and a larger one. And I'm going around those edges with the whisks and food is not getting stuck in there. So add my salt, pepper, and spices. Add the milk. And once this comes to a boil and starts to thicken, uh, give that a minute or two and then I add my cheese. Now if you go with bigger chunks of cheese rather than grating the cheese, it's a little bit quicker sometimes, a little bit less mess. You just have to stir a little bit longer until that cheese melts and is well incorporated. Add my par-cooked broccoli and cauliflower to the gratin dish. Coat with the bechamel. Add some buttered breadcrumbs to the top and into an oven for a half hour or so. And we've got pork chops and gravy and a broccoli and cheese gratin. A fantastic Sunday sit on the couch meal. And I think both of the cookware pieces performed nicely. And after I laid it on that bechamel, I also went back around the edge of that saucier. I used um, a larger whisk and a smaller whisk and went around those edges multiple times. Also, after I got the bechamel sauce out and onto the broccoli and cauliflower, I went back in with my finger and felt around there and there was no food uh, stuck or gunked on to that angle. Let's look at a little bit more of capacity and browning, uh, making some kind of weeknight chicken parm here. And my wife started out here with two mutant GMO supermarket chicken breasts, cut those up and pounded them out. And did I notice her kind of laughing maniacally, giggling a little under her breath as she did this? Is that a bad sign? Got those pounded out. And what I found almost disturbing here is that those two supermarket chicken breasts produced um, at least 10 uh, nice sized pieces of chicken parm, plus an additional tray of stragglers that didn't make it onto the uh, video here. 
So she got those floured in an egg wash and ready to cook. And again, we see the capacity here. It holds five big pieces of chicken parm. Nice browning. Uh, did a couple of pans of those. Then got some uh, red sauce on top, some cheese, and some fresh basil. Put those in the oven. And I thought some absolutely delicious weeknight chicken parm. Bacon. I got nine pieces of bacon in this Falk frying pan. Um, a little bit overcrowded there, but as I've always said, if you're going to overcrowd a pan, you might as well overcrowd it with bacon. And with bacon, it's not that big of a deal because it shrinks up. I started that in a cold pan, then put it on the burner, gave it a couple early turns, and the bacon shrunk down, and I easily cooked nine pieces of bacon in one pan with this Falk. Let's pop down to the old uh, flat top stove, flat top electric in the basement and check and see if these pans warp or not. Very important, especially with a flat top stove for a big wide frying pan to remain flat and not warp or change shape as it's heated. Gonna make some Hari Kover, which we also called green beans when my mom made them growing up, and some steaks. Starting with the green beans, I'm going to get these blanched for a bit in the saucier. I let mine go for about seven minutes. You can obviously adjust that for your desired level of crunch based on your personal tolerance for intestinal discomfort and crunchy veggies. Drain those. And in the meantime, uh, I got the pan dried out, add some butter and olive oil, um, soften up a shallot, add some garlic, Add the beans back to the saucier and toss those and got some delicious Hari Kover green beans. Meanwhile, over in the frying pan, um, I'm a little skittish with copper and doing any type of high heat sear. Now I know that the stainless steel cooking surface, it's not like the tin. It can handle higher heat but I'm still just a little skittish with it. Um, I'm not sure if copper is going to be my go-to uh, steak pan, but what I did here, and I'm uh, kind of getting used to this technique of starting steaks cold in a cold pan and then bringing them up to heat and seeing how, how that works, and I did that here. I definitely didn't do a high temp sear here, and I think, um, even though I love this copper pan, I'm still gonna keep a cast iron or a carbon steel as my go-to for uh, searing a steak. So Hari Kover, a nice steak and a beverage. Not a bad lunch, I gotta say. Now I wanna do a little bit more here on this flat top and at least raise that heat up just a little bit. Cooking some quadratic beef. A good old square of supermarket ground cow. And I end up actually cooking uh, beef like this twice a week on average because I have a little son and I want him to get some red meat and some protein. He's a growing boy. And one way to get him to eat that is to make manwiches. So I've actually made manwiches a ton in these fancy pans here, going at a little bit higher heat. And importantly here, the pan stays flat. So I didn't get any warping or spinning um, at relatively high heat here. And I checked the pan again right before the video. Let's take a look. It is still flat after four months as a daily driver. So that is very important if you cook with a big wide frying pan on a flat top stove. Speaking of beef, I've cooked a ton of beef for those sandwiches, like I said, on the gas stove top, nice even cooking there. I even cooked some in the saucier, so you can brown beef in the saucier, and adding the sandwich sauce is actually may even work out better because it kind of contains some of the splatter of the browning beef a little bit. More beef here, these are some hamburgers, and what I want to do here is use this as a jumping off point into talking about cleaning and maintenance. So this was what was left in the pan after cooking four burgers. Um, about the worst thing I've had to clean up, maybe the bacon uh, rivaled this, 
But what I want to show here is that with these fancy copper pans, you can't put them in the dishwasher, first thing. You got to wash them by hand. Uh, that hamburger grease I scraped out as much as I could. Then I hit the pan with dish soap and a sponge. And then I hit it with a little barkeeper's friend. And that's all I had to do. Nothing out of the ordinary, at least as compared to other stainless steel cooking surfaces that I've used. And I want to throw out a free idea here for the pharmaceutical industry. I know they are always in search of more profits. How about barkeeper's friend for arteries? And a stainless steel cleanup tip here. If after washing your pan it's clean, but you get this weird rainbow effect, all you need to do is hit that clean pan with some white vinegar, rub that around, rinse it out and dry it, and that will remove that rainbow. Now, as far as the copper, I am not doing any maintenance on the copper uh, on these pans. I am letting the patina develop. This is about two years of patina. This is about four months. And what's crazy about these coppers is they come in so shiny and nice and new. It's almost like a new car. You don't even want to touch it. You don't want to get a fingerprint on it. Then you cook in it. And after cooking in it once or twice, the bottoms look like this. Um, especially if you cook on um, cast iron grates, the bottoms of the pans are just going to get scratched up. But that's okay with me though. That just means that someone has cooked something hopefully delicious. And these are not pans for show. These are pans that are here to cook me delicious food. These are working pans now. Now along the cleanup and maintenance lines, I do want to point out one minor problem I ran into here. And if you can see here on the satinated surface, you see those little marks. Those are pits. And those I think came from making some mashed potatoes that we're gonna go with uh, yet another steak. So let's take a look at those. I washed, peeled, and rinsed again some potatoes. And why do I wash my potatoes if I'm going to peel them anyway? Because you know how much dirt I want in my food? None. So I got some water in the Saucy A. I cut up my potatoes, added them to the cold water, added some garlic, got those on the burner, and started bringing them up to heat. So I got those hot potatoes drained. I added some butter and some milk, got out the smasher. Then I got out the whisk and gave them an old school whooping. Placed them in the bowl nicely, added a little more butter. Can you ever go wrong with more butter? No. I served those up with a delicious steak and salad and pretty tasty. But one thing I want to point out here is when I clean the pan, I noticed some small marks on the cooking surface. And what I've come to realize, these are uh, pit marks. And what I think happened is I started the potatoes out in cold water and I thought the water had warmed up enough and I added some salt. And apparently some of that salt didn't get dissolved good enough or well enough and uh, gave me some pit marks. And this is um, an anecdotal observation, but I also got a couple of pit marks in the in the cooking surface of the big frying pan and what i don't know is maybe um, this satinated this matte finish is it a little more prone to salt pitting marks it seems to be compared to some of the other cookware i have with the more mirror polished stainless steel cooking surfaces now it doesn't affect the cooking performance but visually just looking at the cooking surface of a fancy piece of cookware and noticing those marks that's the real pit. Let's talk about just cooking in a saucier in general. This is a relatively wider, shallower pan than, for example, the saucepan. They both have relatively similar capacities, right around three quarts. I cooked grits and lentils, not together, separately in the saucier, and those are two food items that simmer covered for a long time, uh, 20 to 40 minutes here. And what I noticed that with the grits and the lentils both, I measured everything out correctly, 
I ended up needing to add a little more liquid later in the cooking process. And I think that is probably due to the fact that um, as opposed to a saucepan that I would normally use for grits or lentils, these are wider and shallower. And even though covered, there's a little bit more surface area and probably a little more evaporation. Popcorn, believe it or not, the saucier is fantastic for popcorn. Um, all I do is get some olive oil in there, cover the bottom of the pan with popcorn, put the lid on, put it on a burner, and wait for the popping to start. Then wait for the popping to stop. And you got a nice bowl of popcorn there. Let's talk a little bit about capacity. This 3.2 quart saucier is kind of the middle size in the Falk lineup. And if I had it to do over again, they make a bigger one, a 4.8 quart. I think I would go with the 4.8. Let me show you what I'm talking about here with some polo con arroz, chicken with rice. And I saw this recipe, this is a Jacques Pepin recipe. And it is similar to, but not exactly, a paella. Made a lot of paella last year, so I thought it was within the wheelhouse. Full disclosure here, what I'm showing in this video is the second time I made this recipe. The first time, um, a couple things happened. I'm gonna do a separate video on it, but I completely mangled the recipe. But we all might get a good laugh at some of the problems and uh, learn a trick or two about cooking in copper from a completely separate video. So that will be another video coming down the road. But in this one, it worked well. What we're gonna do is take some bone-in skin on chicken thighs, and I'm gonna brown those. So you can brown in the saucier and they release nicely. Now granted, these are mutant GMO supermarket chicken thighs, but still this 3.2 quart only held two of them. I would like to have a little more room and cook a little bit more chicken. And then I had a pretty good looking mise en place here. I got some onion in there, I got some chorizo. And remember, I did not say this was paella. I said it was similar to paella. And you got to be very careful when you use the word paella on YouTube because the paella police will be on you in a heartbeat if you deviate from the traditional way of making paella. But if I say similar to a paella, although not paella itself, we should be okay. So I've got some chorizo in there, some tomatoes. I got some Spanish bomba paella rice. I've got some stock with some saffron. Get everything in there, get it covered up and let that cook 20, 25 minutes. And some really good chicken with rice. The only problem here is it was a little bit crowded for the recipe, and I'd like to have just a little more space. Obviously not the fault of the pan, the pan performed flawlessly, but if I were to do it over again, I would get the little bit bigger size because I would like to cook a little more food. And I do need a little more food. Okay, it's not all grits and popcorn around here. Let's cook a few fancier things. Uh, first up, some white beans and kale. Don't fear the kale. I started with some white Italian cannellini white kidney beans and bonus points here if you start from dried like I did. I've got a bunch of kale washed, de-ribbed and cut up. I got some onion, I've got some butter, I got some olive oil and we're gonna saute that onion just a little bit, add some garlic. And then add in that kale and wilt that down. And it might be nice here to have a lid, but I didn't wanna spend another couple hundred dollars for a lid, so I let that wilt uh, slowly and carefully. Add in my white beans. Make sure everything is coated and thoroughly heated and then add that to some toasted crusty bread. And that makes a nice, healthy, delicious appetizer or a main if you eat the entire pan. Here, a little chicken persiade, another Jacques Pepin recipe I learned from taking a Jacques Pepin cooking course. An easy, simple, and quick recipe Yet when it's done, it seems extra fancy. So what I've got here is some chicken breasts, which I have cut up in uh, roughly one inch or so chunks. Going to lightly salt, pepper, and flour those, and lightly brown those in the fork. I think it does a good job here. And then I'm gonna add the persiade, which is parsley and garlic chopped together. Let that cook for 30, 45 seconds or so. 
and serve that up. But it's a good looking dish and it's easy and simple. And as a bonus, most people in America have never tried some of these French dishes. So if you put a dish like this in front of someone, it tastes great and it looks great. And if you say it's chicken persiad, it sounds very, very fancy and doesn't really reflect the simplicity and ease with which you cooked it. Okay, all in all, what do I think of the Falk Copper Cookware? Um, if you've been around the channel for a while, you can probably tell that if I make this my most used pan and use it for two years, and these other guys have been daily drivers for four months, and I bought a piece for my mom, I'm gonna like them, and I do. I give these Falk Copper Cookware pots and pans a resounding thumbs up. Very high quality pieces of cookware. And I gotta say, in the world of real deal copper cookware, we start to get in the stratosphere of cookware prices. Even at over $300 for that big frying pan, I gotta say these faults on a relative basis are screaming values in the world of copper cookware. Now they're not 100% perfect. I had some trouble with rusting on this cast iron handle on the classic series, that's a consideration. Um, if you commit to taking care of your cookware and not making mistakes, I think the classic line is better looking. That's subjective. The signature line with the stainless steel handle, a kind of sleeker, more modern look, but a lot less maintenance and worry with that stainless steel handle. That's a consideration. Uh, you got to get used to the satinated uh, matte cooking surface. Um, if you're not careful when adding salt to these things, you can get pit marks like I did, unfortunately. One other thing to note, especially as regards the saucier, if you're looking for a saucier for rounded sides, just know that the falk is gonna have a little bit more of a definitive angle where the cooking surface meets the sidewall of the pan. Um, it did not affect my cooking whatsoever. A whisk went in there, a spoon went in there, and it was fine. But if you're looking for rounded sides, just be aware that the faults aren't quite as rounded as maybe some other saucier's. Now, I don't believe these faults are available at retail. They are sold through the uh, company-owned website at copperpans.com. I don't have any relationship with them, but that's where you'd want to go if you want to uh, get more information or order one for yourself. There are a few available on uh, Amazon, and I will put links up to those as well. I think a way to get started if you are wanting to dip your toe into the waters of real deal copper or just want to try a falk, I think that try me deal, $154 for this piece of cookware here, great way to try one and get started in a screaming bargain on this pan. Look somewhere on this screen for links to other fantastic cooking videos from Uncle Scott's Kitchen that you might find entertaining and enjoyable. Leave your questions, comments, and feedback below. In particular, I'd like to know if any of you guys have used some falks, what you think of them. Hopefully the video presented plenty of information and a good cross section of some real world cooking I did in these guys. Thank you for watching. We'll see you again next time on Uncle Scott's Kitchen. Mm -hmm.